Good morning, everybody. It's Peter here from AJS, also representing our sister company in New Zealand, GNA Warburtons. And once again, we're taking you into a jeweler's workshop somewhere in Australasia. Mm -hmm. And this week, we have the pleasure of going to sunny Adelaide and the even sunnier Catherine Grocott. Good morning, Catherine. How are you? Good morning, everybody. Hope everybody's well. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Great to have you back on board, Catherine. And I'm really looking forward to today's demonstration where we're actually talking about setting up your bench. So yep. would you like to elaborate a little bit about what we're going to get up to today? Yes, will do. First of all, I'd like to uh, acknowledge that I am living, working and creating on the lands of the Ghana peoples and acknowledge their elders past, present and emerging. So yes, as Peter said, we are looking at setting up your bench. Um, the, one of the great things about uh, having your own space is that you can set it up the way that you want to. Um, now, if some of you might follow me on Instagram or Facebook, and you might have realised that I have moved my studio from Jam Factory back to my home studio. So I thought this might be a timely uh, kind of demonstration to help people uh, think about some ideas about setting up their own space. Uh, now, just a little bit of a caveat here that everybody needs to work out how they work for themselves. I am a naturally kind of neat, tidy person and I like to have things kind of ordered and kind of within easy reach and things like that to make it easy for myself when I'm creating. For me, I have a kind of a messy space, messy head kind of a personality so that when my space is ordered and calm and yet yeah, neat and tidy, it is so much easier for me to be able to design and create and, and work. That may not be the case with you. So I acknowledge that everybody has their own way of working and their own way of figuring out how their space works best for them. So do, you do need to know a bit of, you know, know thyself in this kind of scenario. Um, oh, Catherine, I'm sure everyone really enjoys working in a nice, clean, orderly workspace. It's just a matter of how long does that workspace stay clean and orderly? That's the thing. That Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, even yeah. I will have messy times if there is, uh, you know, a looming deadline um, or something's, you know, gone chaotically wrong with a design. So, yes, sometimes your ideal way of working may not be the reality all the time. Uh, but, yes, we'll, we'll discuss some ideas and concepts as we go along. Uh, now, the other thing is uh, because we have this wonderful way of dealing with Zoom, uh, Everybody's more than welcome to post pictures of your bench space or how you might solve a storage issue or how you organise your tools, you know, your pliers or your hammers. So please, you know, put those in the, um, the chat uh, and share that knowledge around. Uh, but also you can put in the chat things like, um, well, not only questions, so if you do have any questions, please ask. Uh, but also any of your kind of solutions or ideas of how you organise things. So utilise that chat function. All right. Thanks very much, Catherine. Just before you get underway, I'd just like to say hello to Elizabeth, who's introduced herself. There's other people there as well. So if you'd like to say hi and where you're from, that'd be wonderful. And as Catherine alluded to, please participate in today's conversation. And if you've got any ideas or thoughts, please put them forward. It'd be great. Okay, that over to you, Catherine. <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> so what I'd like to do first is just go through like a couple of principles that I tend to work by when I'm setting up any space. Um, you know, at the moment, I'm in my kind of jewellery workshop at home. However, I have two other kind of creative outlets and behind me, I've got my paper crafting and book binding. And over here on the side, I have my sewing. So my kind of workspace has to kind of involve those three things. Uh, so therefore space is at a premium and therefore I need to be quite uh, clever 
with how I organise this space. So a few principles that I tend to work by. Uh, the first one, and we're going to get out the pens and pencils, you know, got to have got to have pens and paper. Uh, one of the first things I uh, kind of strive for when I'm working is efficiency. Um, I like to be able to do things quick, easy, um, without too much hassle. So I tend to find that um, I'll organise things in a way that means the work flows relatively logically and simply. Um, now, this is not just for my workspace. I also do the same kind of thing in my kitchen, um, you know, so that when I'm cooking, I can lay my hand on a, you know, a pot and a pan and very close by is a, you know, a spoon or a ladle. Uh, so I kind of, you know, think this way for any creative outlet. Uh, the second thing I kind of try to do, especially at the bench, is to have my tools within hand's reach or within arm's reach. Uh, so, again, that means I'm not having to, you know, stand up, move around, go get something, come back, and that creates inefficiencies in my system. So if I can have everything within arm's reach, that is fantastic. There is a wonderful story that my brother told me about the car that I drive, which is a Nissan 300ZX. And apparently the whole of the, um, like the dashboard, the cockpit of where the driver sits was designed by an aircraft pilot who said he wanted every single thing that the, a driver had to deal with within fingertip distance of the steering wheel. And that's pretty much it. That whole, the whole cockpit in the, in the car, everything can be reached just by reaching at your fingertips. So that's kind of what I'm trying to do here, uh, trying to make things very, very easily accessible so that I'm not having to waste time uh, when I'm creating something. Everything's here, bang, 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 and I can do things quickly and efficiently. So, Catherine, are you saying that if you're organised with everything close range, your jewellery making will take off? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> I like that. Oh, I, I hope that is true. <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> um, so within kind of leading on from that is a principle that uh, lots of kind of ordered people live by, and certainly if you go into a really organised men's shed, this is one they'll uh, relate to. Uh, it is a place, a place for everything and everything in its place. What this means is that once I figure out a good flow, then I tend to keep things in the same place. And that can go for things like uh, when I set up my pliers, my pliers are actually in the same order. Every time I put them back, I'll put them back in the same order. So that means that I know my chain nose pliers are always fourth from the, the left. Uh, you know, when I've have to get out my normal hammer, I know that it's on the bottom of my hammer stand uh, closest to me. Uh, so my, you know, my number two uh, saw blades are in a container over here on the side because that's the one I use the most. So, yeah, having a place for everything and everything in its place saves a lot of time and effort and energy. It means you're not looking for things because it should be right back where it belongs. Um, so, Catherine, just to interrupt, I'm, I'm sure if you adopt that theory and find a place for everything, and if you can't find a place for everything, that means you've got either too much stuff, yeah. which means you've got a cull, or you've got to find some more storage to be able to cope for that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, and that that is 
kind of one of the, I suppose, dilemmas of being a collector of tools. You know, every time you go to back to AJS and it's like, oh, there's a new tool. Look what I could do with that. Um, and then you do think, well, where am I going to fit it? Especially um, many of you may not like own your own studio. If you're renting a space, there may be limitations on what you can and can't do in that space. So, um, yeah, thinking about uh, some of your limitations might have to come into how you think about setting up your, your bench space. Um, yeah, we're stressing out Jimmy. He says, oh, my God, folks would lose their minds if they saw the jumbled state of my workbench. <laughs> if it were. Anyway, Jimmy, uh, <laughs> Yeah, stay tuned, Jimmy, and uh, you yeah. might get a couple of ideas today. Yeah. Uh, now, the next one is one that has been influenced with me because a number of the people who've trained me in my jewellery background have come from very German backgrounds. Uh, that actually probably influences kind of my organisation as well. Um, but... Consistently through what I've learned from them is the next principle. Uh, which is clean up at the end of every day. Do we have to? <laughs> well, I kind of do this within um, limits. If I'm working on something that is, I know is going to take multiple days, then quite often I will kind of clear away what I am no longer using. So get that clutter out back in its place. And if I'm going to leave anything on the bench for the next day so that I can just start immediately, it's the tools that I need to start with the next day. Um, so if I'm, you know, just about to, you know, start sawing something, I'll have my piece and I'll have my saw frame out. Um, but the other things I'll pack away until I need them so that in the morning I come in, it's clean, it's fresh, it's ready to roll with what I'm trying to do. Um, if I'm then, if, it, if I come in and then I've got the chaos on the, the bench space and I'm trying to find what I need to start with, then I haven't kind of started the day in a, a good way. So I try to do mm. the clean up at the end of the day and I walk away, it's fresh, and I know that when I come in, I can start immediately without having to kind of stress or worry about, you know, where things are or what I'm doing. I'm sure um, a clear workspace is a clear headspace. So, for me, yes. And, <laughs> and therefore a more creative environment for you, I'm sure. That, yes. For me, that I find that very much to be true, that if I... Um, if the kind of space around me is kind of peaceful, clear, clean, then it frees up my head to focus on creativity, to focus on design. I can come up with more alterations or alternatives. Um, but if it's messy, then my focus tends to be on the mess rather than on the creativity. So clearing this up helps me to be creative. Um, now that's, as I said, that's not how everybody works. And, you know, knowing how you work best is always, you know, yeah, you know yourself and how you work. So knowing that you operate your, your bench space, but hopefully this might give some, uh, some ideas and, and some thoughts, uh, if people are beginning to set up or if they're kind of struggling with, the flow of their workspace or trying to be efficient. And our last thing, uh, my brother gave me a label maker once for my birthday, best present ever, label things. Um, now, I tend to keep this mostly for things that are potentially going to be able to be moved around. So like my storage boxes that you can see behind me, I've got those labelled um, so that I know kind of what's in each of those because they certainly the little ones have the potential to be flipped or moved uh, to different places as I'm kind of having to lift off one and get to another. So if they're labelled, I can always very quickly identify where things are. Um, 
The other thing I do tend to do is I label um, the sizes of things like burrs and drills um, because having to spend time measuring your drill bit and your burr to do a very specific job, so time consuming. So again, label those things so that, you know, that that's a labelled pole so that when you're doing a job, I know that that is the 0.8 mil one. That's good. I don't have to kind of, again, yeah, get on with the job. All right, so there are a few of my, the principles that I work through. Uh, so I thought I'd give you, we're going to go on a little bit of a tour. So this is a, you know, like a, a room tour. Um, this is what we've been looking forward to, Catherine. Uh, I, before I take you on a camera tour, I thought I would just kind of do a little bit of a, you know, a drawing of just the, like my bench space so, so that you can get an idea of um, kind of how you could potentially um, yeah, set things up. And if people want to take, you know, a screenshot of this picture, they can, um, you know, for those ideas. So basically I have a bench with my little cutout and my bench peg. Yeah. So uh, I've got a number of tools that I use the most kind of on my bench space. So kind of in this corner, I have like a little anvil or um, steel block. Uh, next to it, I've got my little mini vice. Uh, unfortunately, having moved from Jam Factory back home, uh, I now only have a little mini vice, not the wonderful great big vices at, um, yeah, at Jam Factory. Next door to that, I, have, I do have my calipers. Um, because I do find that I measure a lot of things for accuracy. So I have my calipers kind of right next door to make that quick and accessible. I have a little jar up here of things like my long things. So there's skewers and rulers and, um, yeah, anything that's long and tall because uh, it's then easily accessible as I reach over the bench. So long tools are over here. I have a little garbage bin. there for any kind of scraps or um, uh, especially some of my like broken saw blades and things like that. That's my little tiny little garbage bin for those. And then along the back, this is where I've got kind of two lots of plier stands. Um, this, my pliers are probably one of the things that I use the most and it's this one here where my most common ones live. How many pliers would you have, Catherine? Oh, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. About maybe, yeah, 14 on each, so 28, yeah. Wow. Um, and then mm. I, do, I do have a few more that are kind of duplicates or, you know, much more specialised that I, I don't use very often. Uh, in a toolbox. So some of my spares that, yeah, are either so specialised um, or they're kind of, I think I've got, you know, three cutters that are almost the same. So it's like, I don't need three cutters on my bench, you know. One is fine. <laughs> um, so then I've got uh, two kind of rotary um kind of yeah, moving, revolving kind of containers that hold a lot of my um, micromotor tools. Um, so they're kind of, again, quite easy to access. Um, and the fact that they spin uh, is really helpful. The other thing I do with those is I keep them in order. So when remind me to tell you that when we do the tour so that when you look at it, if I've got, say, my, um, my satin wheels, for example, 
they will go from coarse to fine, you know, left to right, coarse to fine. But then I will repeat that concept on every other thing that is there that will do the same thing. So my polishing um, uh, silicon wheels, they will all go from the coarsest to the finest in their different shapes. Uh, so again, place for everything, everything in its place. Uh, and having them in that kind of order means that I know if I'm needing to sand something, I'm going from the coarsest to the finest. Um, over here, I've got all of my um, sanding box or sanding sticks in a tall container, because again, them being tall, they're easy to reach. I've got a little carousel of my most common saw blades for easy replacement. And then I have a wooden block that has holes in it with gravers and um, center punch, uh, scoring tools, scribes, etc. So that's kind of how I have everything set up around the kind of edges of my bench, which means I've got this massive, nice big space in the middle for my working area. Uh, and this is what I try as much as possible to keep kind of clear and clean uh, so that, yeah, it's kind of this, it's almost like the new page on your design journal. It's fresh, it's clean, it's ready for, you know, for work, for creativity. Um, and it just, for me personally, it's kind of like, it feels the most um, yet ready to create. Um, you know, if it's cluttered, then it's more stressful. So this is when it's the most, uh, yeah, inspiring and um, generating ideas. So. Okay. Now, Jimmy, Jimmy's very impressed with your 28 pair of pliers. So I'm sure he's looking forward to seeing those in a minute, Catherine. Yep. So you're going to take us on a little tour? Let's go on a tour. All right. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to be um, taking the camera out of my little stand here. So then... Uh, be prepared for hopefully not too many wiggles in as I hand take you around uh, my studio. All right, everybody ready? Yep. How was that? Not too bad. Fine. Right. Yep. So this, I'll stand up and uh, so that you can kind of get a better picture of my bench. So as I said, my little, got my little anvil in there bit protected from the air and a steel block, my little vise, calipers, my ruler with my tall things, my little garbage bin, got a couple of little uh, tools there, my set squares, and here are my pliers, Jimmy. <laughs> <laughs> so as you can see, I've got mine kind of set up in an order. Uh, so I've got these red-handled ones are all the ones that I use kind of most commonly. And as you can see, kind of in order of almost kind of how often I use them too. You know, my flat nose pliers, half round pliers, uh, my two lots of chain nose, round nose, um, and flat round. Uh, so they always stay in that order for ease of access. And it also means I know very quickly when I look at them if something's missing. If I've taken something to a workshop, and I come back and it's like, okay, where am I X, Y, Z? I can quickly identify which one is missing and, yeah, therefore access it. And right, right next door are all my um, parallel pliers. Um, you know, I love a good parallel plier. They are so handy. Um, and then I've got my specialised yep. um, bale making pliers. Catherine, excuse me, um, Ruth has just asked a question that I was thinking too. Um, the fact that you've got your most common pliers on the left, does that mean you use them with your left hand or not? Oh, no, I don't. I actually use them with my right. Um, but mm -hmm. I do tend to, because of the way that I kind of work, um, like because my micromotor is on my right, I tend to keep my micromotor tools over the top of my uh, micromotor so that they're kind of ordered. However, 
quite often, um, yeah, I will, I will try to, yeah, pick up with my left and pass to my right. Um, however, that may be a better way of doing that for um, other people is to have things that are going to be used in your right hand to be on the right-hand side of your bench. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, again, thinking through if that's going to be a more efficient way of you working, absolutely, um, yeah. For me, it's Or even of, the thought was you had, you had the uh, most common pliers on the left-hand side of your rack. I, I might have thought they might have been on the right-hand side of your rack. Yeah, yeah. For me, hmm. it's actually more about in, in the way that my mind is working, kind of most... Yeah most used left to right because that's how I read. So it's just, a yeah, kind of a more of a mental yep. organisation. Right, we're getting an insight into Catherine's brain here, mm -hmm. so that's yeah. uh, <laughs> something we didn't expect. Yeah. And so, yeah, my specialised pliers tend to be on the other side. So I've got my cutters and, um, uh, yeah, little hole punch, flush cutters, um, and some of the specialised ones that I don't use very often that may only do one job, um, you know, so I've got coil pliers and um, earring wire pliers and stuff like that. So here with my uh, micromotor tools, you'll see, like, all the, um, how I've set up my kind of tools here. I'll just stand up again. Um, so with my sandpaper, coarsest, all the way down to the finest grade. Silicon tools coarsest, down to fine. Satin wheels, coarsest, down to fine. Uh, so this kind of helps me to be able to find everything quickly and easily. And over here, I've got uh, just a few things that I don't use as much. So this one is kind of a bit further away. Don't use these as much. You can probably tell I like uh, a satin finish on my work rather than a high polish. The polishing's further away. <laughs> um, but yes, I've got some of my uh, kind of tools that I don't use as much on this side. My sanding sticks in a very big container there. Uh, my most common used saw blades there and my gravers here over on the side. Now, with this is probably the one thing that I could potentially move from off my desk. I'm not a big stone setter. Um, so having my gravers here, probably a, a bit unnecessary, but, you know, that side of the bench is not going to be utilised as much. So they're working there at the moment. So if we come underneath my bench, you'll see some of the things that, uh, that I have underneath. Now, I was very, very fortunate in being able to purchase this bench from AJS um, Oh, a number of years ago. So this is like, it's a purchased bench. However, many people will make up their own bench, um, you know, and make it out of, you know, an old table and heighten it and cut bits out and things like that. So if you're making your own bench, you can completely and utterly customise it to what you want. Uh, but some of the kind of great features of this bench is the fact that there is a soldering station right at your bench. So it means that I don't have to get up to do my soldering. So where is my soldering equipment? Right underneath. So I keep my soldering stuff just underneath. So it's all there. I just move it up to the bench, solder. Um, yeah. Now, a jam factory always had, oh, actually, no. When I was in the studio, in the jewellery and metal um, studio department, uh, our soldering, we could have a soldering bench right at our, um, at our workbenches. That was kind of designed into our associate spaces. But when I moved into a studio, we actually set up a soldering bay. So the three of us who were in that um, studio, we actually had a designated soldering area. Uh, so that might work better for some people to have a completely separate space for their soldering setup. So I've got my micromotor under there, and this is where I keep my 
like burrs and drills. Now, one of the things, as I said before, like as you can see, I've got them all kind of labelled with what type they are, you know, the setting burrs, the heart burrs, the, you know, round burrs. But then when I open one of those up, you might be able to see inside. Yeah, I've got each size labelled um, next to, yeah, the size of the burr. So for me, what I have done is, again, I purchased a, a set of sizes and these become my working tools. These are the ones that I, um, that I utilise when I'm actually using them. And then I will purchase a, you know, a set of, you know, the, the six, um, say, for example, one mil drill bits and I will move a new one into my working one when my working one has died. Um, so this is a kind of a way for me of kind of knowing how these are going to be kept organised and what is the best way of uh, kind of being efficient with my tools. So I'll keep my working ones at the front and then my kind of the spare ones are up the back. You can see in the kind of little canisters up there. Um, you know, ready to replace the ones. And so my most common sizes, I'll have multiple spares because I'm more likely to break those. Um, it's a very impressive drawer there, Catherine. Yeah. Oh, what? yeah. Neat and tidy. <laughs> yeah. um, and then underneath there is a little um, pull-out drawer. So for those of you who work with, um, you know, precious metals, one of the great tips I was given was to have like a little tray. Um, that, now, this works with a pull-out tray like this. It might not be as efficient or effective if you've got a little skirt. Um, but, yeah, this tray collects all the lemel, all the filings, et cetera, and then I can then pour that into a container ready for refining or recycling. Um, so I have come across jewellers who actually have a separate tray for every single one of the metals they use, especially if they are doing lots of things with multiple types of gold, platinum, um, yeah, those precious uh, metals. They'll have a different tray to help um, prevent contamination. And then that, if they're doing their own if they make their own um, alloys, they've got, yeah, they're kind of scrap ready to kind of melt again and reuse. Um, it also helps, you know, the people who are, you know, if you're taking it to refineries to get um, to get refined, if it's all separated. Um, I'm not a, a big user of lots of different types of precious metals. So for me, it's mostly keeping... Um, collecting all the silver for doing like things like sand casting. Um, copper, not so worried about keeping that. Um, but, yeah, keeping my silver for sand casting, that's always helpful. And then there's just a couple of things in here, like I've got a little brush and um, um, a different type of bench peg and, you know, spare ceramic things. Um, now, the other thing is that not, even though this is a perfect, purchased bench I've still made modifications to it so just around the corner this is one of the Ooh. modifications so here uh, a wonderful friend of mine who uh, kind of operates in um, used to go to like the men's shed and he had his own um, woodworking studio he has made me this wonderful little kind of two-layer hammer holder uh, so I've got, you know, a few of my hammers there. Um, and now that I'm at home and my soldering station is at my bench, uh, that first one now just gets used to hook my uh, soldering torch up ready to uh, do soldering. Uh, but as you can see, I've got, you know, like a, not just hammers, but there's sneaking out the back, there is a um, uh, like a hand drill. 
The other thing that I've done to, I'm, I'm going to disappear underneath the bench for this. <laughs> the other thing I've done down here is I've put a couple of little hooks for my um, sandpaper. So I've put the hooks there. The sandpaper um, is then kind of, again, from coarse to finest uh, and then some, you know, a spare pack. So working ones at the front, clean ones in the pack. Uh, and then I have a little box there of just the scraps of the of sandpaper. So they're kind of they're always at my at my feet ready to go. Um, and I, depending on kind of again what scenario in, will depend on even just things like what chair you use. So because I'm not doing a lot of like graving, engraving. Um, or One of the things for me is kind of not having lots and lots of clutter around me. So I do keep a lot of things in my drawers. Uh, so top drawer is kind of my kind of heavy things um, with my mandrels. Now, I had a dream of another modification for this bench, which was to have some kind of mechanism where I could lock my mandrels in place inside the drawer, close the drawer, and then have it as a, you know, a mandrel um, kind of working space. Haven't got to that one yet. Still a dream, hence the reason why the mandrels are in the top drawer, because that's a hope for the future. Now, as I go down the drawers, as I go down, they go down in kind of order of how I would normally utilise them. So the foot, you know, Second drawer. Second drawer is where I have my saws and air, all the equipment that goes with them. So my saw frames, um, my chenille cutter, uh, jump ring cutter, uh, and my the majority of my saw blade replacement. So I've got a little um, canister that uh, yeah holds my saw blades. Second one is filing. So, you know, usually you're sawing first, then you're filing. So all my files are in my second drawer. As I need them, I'll take them out, pop them on the bench, utilise, uh, and then when I don't need them, put them away. And then polishing. So kind of order of how I would utilise them, polishing is in the next drawer. Then for my final four drawers, they become a little bit more specialised then. So as I go down, I've got my wax carving and, yeah, wax making tools. Then I've got uh, some of my kind of more specialised um, metal and acrylic tools uh, and all my acrylic samples. We go down to, yeah, this is a bit of the... Uh, you know, the second drawer in most kitchens is the chaotic second drawer. This is like the chaotic second drawer for jewellery. It's the, the odds bits and pieces. Um, yeah, kind of glues and sticky tape and, yeah, magnets. And then the final drawer is my spares. So this is where I keep, um, you know, my spare silicon wheels, my spare satin wheels, because um, so often you buy them in, you know, bulk packages uh, so this is where the bulk packages go and then my working tools come out and are, are in order so that's that's my bench but wait there's more <laughs> uh, as I of course there's always more tools to be had so if you come with me we'll go over and see some more um, more of the space so over here, this is my polishing and pickle space. Um, now, 
as you can see, I am yeah, not set up in a rental property for uh, things like extraction. So what I do with my polishing wheel is a trick that uh, one of the, Andrew actually, up at the Brisbane AJS office, um, he, he put me onto this. But when I'm polishing, I will actually fill this with water, uh, just this bottom area. I'll do my polishing. The container collects it, uh, and then I will uh, remove that once I'm finished. And then I've got my pickle station up the back. And this is where some of my heavy duty tools are. So I've got my, you know, forming tools, um, my disc cutter, Dremel, and I've got my one of my soldering um, tripods that, again, doesn't get utilised a lot, but it's nearby, close enough that I can access it. And then, I hope nobody's getting dizzy or anything. This is where okay. I put my tools, uh, like a, a lot of my, um, sorry, resources and equipment that I use. So as you can see, everything's labelled. So I've got, you know, one container for, um, you know, things like my chemicals that I use for etching aluminium. I've got a resin container, uh, some resources of a variety of different types. Uh, I do quite a bit of um, dyeing of um, PVC and acrylic. Uh, so I've got my dyeing stuff, opaque enamels for enamelling, the spare jewellery tools that I have. Uh, you know, which, which includes things like when I first started jewellery making, I was, you know, just on the kitchen table kind of thing. So I've got a, a screw on bench peg uh, in there and some jewellery equipment that I use. And then over here, some more kind of, again, more specialised things with glass, my GR, GRS tools for my um, GRS uh, on my bench, steel, some 3D printing stuff, thread, uh, prototypes of things that I've been working on. Uh, and some of my uh, kind of fabric dyes down the bottom. The other thing I have here is how I sort my metals. Uh, so I have found I work mostly in sterling silver, but a variety of other metals. And so, again, I'll have them sorted. So I've got my round wire, square wire, rectangular wire, tube, and sheet, and then I've got the other kind Could of... Could you open a tray or two for us? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I've got them in, and it, even within here, each one will be labelled for what thickness it is. So, you know, that's my, you know, 0.5 mil. There'll be one mil, there'll be 1.2. Um, I seriously want to find... Uh, actually, let's find... I want to find, oh, this. I want to find little plastic bags that, you know, are snap lock bags that are 30 centimetres long because that's how long, you know, so many like tubing and stuff comes in. They'll be so easy. Uh, doesn't seem to exist unless I get them specially made. Oh, so. no. Oh, the tragedy, you know, the inefficiency of multiple size bags. Oh. So, yes, I've got aluminium, brass, copper, uh, some gold, nickel, silver, steel, and titanium. And then my other drawers have, you know, a few bits of like acrylic. Um, and I think, oh, and things that uh, need to be finished, some enameling in there. <laughs> um, and I've also got like a little toolbox over here that um, if I go to workshops or things and I need equipment, I'll take the toolbox with me. Uh, and then some of my kind of notes and um, sample books and, uh, you know, things that for professional development and workshops that I've done. Uh, and, of course, very important, my jewellery journal. So that has records of the things that I've made, how I've made them, uh, et cetera. So wow. that's... I'll tell you what, for, for one person, you've impressed Jimmy very much. <laughs> so he says... <laughs> Very cool. And this is a person who uh, says he admits that he's got a messy desk. So I think he might want to engage you to come <laughs> and help sort himself, sort him out. My family often jokes that I should do things like that and come and organise people's houses. <laughs> yeah. The trouble is you'd have to keep them organised. Yeah, that, yes. Um, I do find that, again, 
For me personally, once I get over that initial mess of like moving in and figuring out how things are going to work the best and all that kind of stuff, once I've figured that out, then usually after that it becomes a lot easier to keep things clean and tidy because you know where things go and you don't have to, you're not exerting lots of mental energy afterwards. It's only the initial kind of stage of getting it set up that's the problem. Um, however, it sounds um, like we've missed the initial stage for Jimmy because he admits that he, it's too late, he can't be fixed. <laughs> now, Jimmy would like to know how long you've been involved in jewellery making, Catherine. Oh, okay, yes. For, for me, I have been involved um, basically since I was a child. So my mum taught me uh, good old polymer clay. You know, everybody starts with Fimo when they're, you know, little and you've got creative mums. Uh, so I started with Fimo jewellery. Um, my mum was doing the more kind of intricate designs of flowers and galas that were, you know, very in in the 80s. Um, but she would get me to do like some of the beads, you know, some of the easier things of, you know, just making round beads or um, mixing two colours together and marbling and stuff like that. Uh, but then mum and dad gave me a uh, silver chain making workshop as my 16th birthday. And that's, I think, where it really started, this kind of magic of, um, yeah, being able to make my own bracelet uh, that kind of could match a fob necklace that, again, my parents had given me for my 16th birthday. So uh, kind of... So about 10 years is the answer, is that right? You're yeah. so flattering. <laughs> Can't you tell if I'm great <laughs> Then I'm a lot older than that. <laughs> so, yes, uh, I suppose in total that's if I started when I was about seven or eight, yeah, that's like 40 years. However, in terms of actually um, kind of doing it in a more focused and um, committed fashion, then I would say probably the last nine or ten years but it's definitely been coming to Jam Factory that's really cemented jewellery as a practice for me um, and helping me kind of figure out what does my jewellery practice look like. Uh, so, yeah, I think that experience of the last kind of four, four and a half years um, where I've been able to really focus on, yeah, just jewellery, in and of itself has yeah, been an incredible privilege. Up till then, it was more... Now, Catherine, I'm going to put you on the spot here uh -huh. uh, because uh, Jimmy's uh, he's seen all your, your bench and everything and sees <laughs> the tools you use to make your jewellery. He'd like to see something that you've made or are making. Have you got something handy to show? Oh. Uh, actually, I do. <laughs> um, yeah, let me, let me put you in here. Yep. And hopefully we don't lose the direction. No. Yep, you're right. Yep. All right. So let me move this out of the way to first piece of paper. This is actually a piece um, that I need to, I made this very much in a bit of a rush. Uh, this is a memorial piece to the um, the last head of studio um, before our current head, uh, her name was Alice Potter, and sadly she died uh, at the end of last year. Uh, Alice, um, Alice had this amazing condition called synesthesia. I think I've pronounced that correctly. But her version of it, is where she saw letters and numbers as colours. So this is okay. You've heard of that, yeah? Her name, Alice, in the colours of her synesthetic alphabet. Um, so yeah. Could you bring a the piece a bit closer to the camera for us? Yeah. Oops. Oop, we'll go the yep. right way. Uh, so oh, gosh, I'm going the wrong way. There we go. Uh, so 
A was a dark blue, L was a kind of a kind of ready burgundy colour, I was a, a soft white, almost pale grey colour, C was quite a bright yellow and E was kind of a, a forest green. Um, so this actually spells out her name. Um, now, for all the jewellers out there, you can see a terrible amount of fire scale because I made this um, on the day of our last exhibition of last year and I wanted to honour her um, on that day. So I very, very quickly made this up, but it is on my bench for me to undo those cords, get rid of that terrible fire scale and redo it properly so that, yeah. But what I've done is she was also very well known for um, her textile work and using textiles and um, that kind of traditionally feminine kind of hand skills of embroidery and things like that. She'd use that um, in her work. Uh, so hence the reason why I've used this kind of silk thread and then I've echoed that in the chain uh, so that the chain is also looks like thread. Um, and the back uh, just has some kind of square chenille for the chain. Um, and I would like to solve this problem a bit better. So rather than having these kind of knots on the back, if there's a way of kind of hiding those or tying them in a better way or something. So that's another kind of design solution that I'd like to um, yeah, address. Um, Oh, thanks for sharing that with us, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, that's well done. Put you on the spot and you come through with the goods. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for the question there, Jimmy. Now, now the other thing that um, I suppose is kind of helpful or might be helpful for people to talk about is the fact that this is not the only way that you can set up your tools. Um, there are always alternatives of how you can do things. So back at Jam Factory, when I was in the department studio, the benches that they had set up um, for the associates had pegboards on the back of them. So I found that a wonderful solution when there were no drawers or anything like that to keep things away, um, utilising the pegboard for the tools that I would have normally in my drawer in my own bench. So I had yeah, my saw frame set up. I had my, um, my files were all in like a little um, kind of bag that could then hang there. If I was super keen, what I would have really liked to have done was got a magnet of some kind to put on that pegboard for all my files. Like I think that would have been a much kind of more efficient way of solving that problem. Just have, have them all, you know, mm. kind of like the cook, how they have their all their knives on the magnet. Yes, and indeed. Can just pull them off, yeah. ch ch chop, put them back. In. Yeah. Great idea. So, yeah, magnets, another way. Um, and some of the alternatives that some of the girls uh, oh, and, and guy at Jam Factory, uh, how they've adjusted their benches, um, many of them have their own handmade benches. And one of the girls has a brilliant way of she's got, like, these little um, – kind of wires uh, kind of shaped, you know, three sides of a rectangle almost and inserted underneath her bench top and that's where she stores her pliers. So they're kind of, her pliers are all at her hand height when she's working. Um, so, again, that is an efficient way of doing, um, you know, storing different tools. Um, now, Catherine, I've got a couple of uh, comments and questions. Oh, excellent. Uh, first... Uh, a howdy from the team at AJS in Adelaide. So they said good day. Hi, guys. And <laughs> also Fiona, Fiona has suggested using a whip stitch to hide that thread. Oh, right. Thank you. Let me write that down. <laughs> whip stitch. Thank you, Fiona. Oh, legend. Um, see, this and is one of the great things about doing this online, other people's solutions to problems that you wouldn't think of. Somebody else has got a solution. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I will check that out. And 
Speaking of solutions, uh, Jimmy wants to know, do you use a lanolin spray to keep the rust off your iron tools? Oh. <sighs> yeah. I... <laughs> That is a really good idea, yes. Um, and certainly at Jam Factory with our tools, that's what we did. We had um, kind of a, they, I don't think they used a lanolin tool. I think they used machine oil to keep it coated and protected. And then they would cover that in usually like a custom made um, leather or suede cover um, for the tools. And that is actually something I would like to start doing with my tools. Um, however, I need to fix some of my tools from rust and in my chemical box over there, there is actually a bottle of kind of rust remover. So that's actually one of my jobs, having moved into my, back into my home space, is to attack some of my tools that, uh, some of them got quite, um, yeah, kind of badly affected, uh, in the move where they were in kind of a, um yeah a damp environment for too long and yeah so yes, yes. everyone's been people. there i'm sure yeah. yeah look after your tools if you can especially your yeah your steel tools protect them in some way again that will save you time and effort because i'm going to spend hours trying to fix that um prevention is better than cure that should be another principle that we live by <laughs> look after you so tool. Catherine perhaps we should invite people to put forward any comments uh, anything they've learned out of today any suggestions they'd like to make any practices that they use oh, on absolutely. their tool bench yeah uh, so if you'd like to quickly uh, post anything there we'd uh, love to have your comments and uh, really appreciate the feedback and comments from everybody sorry Catherine if you've got pictures, download pictures so that people can get ideas of yeah, different ways of doing things. If you're game, post a picture of your workbench. <laughs> and so I, there's um, many of you might be aware of like the Young Jewelers group on Facebook. I think it's actually just changed its name. Um, but, yeah, it's... They often have things about, you know, bench spaces and, you know, what are you working on and things like that. So that can be a great space for learning some more kind of solutions for stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, one, what else is there? Oh, and one of the other things that I found at Jam Factory, which was really effective for me, was the... The idea that you would have your bench on one space and when you swiveled your chair around, you had a working table right behind you. Um, and that's something that I carried into my own studio at Jam. A little bit more difficult for me because I've got a cutting table behind me. But, um, yeah, the kind of way that you can then have a, a desk or a table to do drawings or write in your journal or, you know, if you need to make notes about how long something's taken to do so that you know how to um, quote a piece, um, yeah, if you need to remake it in the future, how long did it take, um, all those kinds of things, having that ability to do that around you. Um, yeah. So, Catherine, on the subject of tables, uh, Marg has asked, if you're adapting a table for home space, what size would you recommend? Ooh. Personally, I, if I could go a little bit bigger <laughs> than the bench that I'm putting out, which is one of the reasons I keep it neat and tidy, is that once I've got my tools on the bench, this is a decent amount of space, but wouldn't a little bit bigger be more helpful? So basically what I would probably go kind of no bigger than my kind of arm span. But the benches that I've seen the girls alter at Jam that work really well for them have been kind of the old, um, old kind of uh, home school desks, like homework desks um, that have 
yeah, a little bit of space or, sorry, a decent amount of space on the top and then some, you know, three or four drawers down the side. Uh, and then they've kind of cut into them, put a bench peg on, whether that's they've screwed it on, bolted it on. Um, and then, yeah, if it has got those side walls then they've done something to kind of hang tools off the side on the on the underneath, underneath the table. So, yeah, probably no bigger than your own wingspan. I think if my table was that big, that would probably be a little bit big, but I could still reach everything easily. Um, but, yeah, if I had maybe this would be probably 1,200 mil, I would say, wide and maybe... 500 mil deep. If I had another 10, 15 um, centimetres deep and maybe another 20 centimetres wide, oh, I think I'd be in heaven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Well, Catherine, I think that's a good place to leave it with uh, you uh, contemplating being in heaven, but not just <laughs> yet. <laughs> We want you to do more demos. So uh, <laughs> now, uh, a good way to finish it off too is to um, to just uh, quote Jimmy. Jimmy says, fantastic presentation, Catherine. Loved it. Very well set up for your workflow. I've definitely learned some great organising tips today. Thank you. Marg says, thank you also. And thank you to all the people we had on board with us today, which included Elizabeth, Daphne, Jimmy, Cole, Ruth, Wayne, Marg, Fiona, Andrew and Pauline. So. Awesome. Thank you to all those who watched and all those watching in the future. And Thank Catherine, so we'll look forward everybody. to seeing you again sometime real soon. Thanks, everybody. And yes, love to have you here with us. Thank you so much. <laughs>